All right. Well, good morning again, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the FIATA World Congress. And I hope that during the course of the break this morning, you've had a moment to um, look at what is on showcase in our exhibition hall. You've also had a moment to connect with the technology that's available here, as well as your various colleagues and peers in the industry who continue to join us as part of this week's Congress right here in Cape Town in South Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, as we now continue into the main plenary, we're going to look at some best practice, analyze the metrics and the numbers behind the work that you continue to do in the world of trade, in the world of logistics and supply chain. And our very first speaker this morning to give us some insights at how the Saudi Arabia region stays at the forefront of trade and logistics and how it continues to evolve as well as transform is His Excellency um, Ahmed al Hakbani, who, ladies and gentlemen, is the governor of Saudi Customs. He joined Saudi Customs and took on this role um, in 2017, in April 2017, and continues to serve um, in a number of prominent positions within the Saudi organizations in their government, as well in various state-owned enterprises that lead um, various services in the transportation field in that region. Prior to joining the Saudi Exports Authority, he had also served um, within the Ministries of Information and Technology, as well as the Ministry of Foreign Trade. So not only does he know the policy behind how the machine continues to tick and evolve, but he also now sits at the forefront of making sure that all of that policy, all of those white papers, regulations, um, now come together to ensure that in an economy, um, in a global economy at that, the convergences between technology, systems, solutions, processes, as well as trade, continue to come together. Please give him a very warm welcome to our stage this morning. Hello. Hello, good morning. Uh, it's a great honor and privilege to be here uh, this morning uh, in South Africa, in Cape Town, amongst our key stakeholders at the freight forwarders of the world. Uh, uh, my name, as uh, the uh, MC presented a few minutes ago, my name is Ahmed al Hakwani. I'm the governor of Saudi Customs. Um, just to give you a brief about Saudi Customs, we are a 10,000 employee organization and uh, we operate in 35 ports. Uh, we bring to the, to, the, uh, to the economy, to the country, um, uh, about more than about 5 billion US dollars worth of custom duties. And also, in addition to that, we do also collect VAT and excise taxes. So it's, um, it's a great honor again to be here, and uh, thank you so much for FIATA for allowing us to be part of this great event. So I'll be talking about three main topics. Uh, this morning. The first topic is about Saudi Arabia and the transformation that is taking place in Saudi Arabia. The second point is uh, a bit more detail about logistics and what's happening in logistics in Saudi Arabia and what the plans are and what we have achieved uh, in the past uh, couple of years. And last but not least, how we can work together, how we can ensure that it's, it's a jointly win-win situation for Saudi Arabia as a nation and also our partners in the logistics area. So uh, Saudi Arabia um, uh, has, has, has been established uh, or uh, reunified about 80, 89 years ago. Last week we um, uh, celebrated our 89th uh, anniversary. But as the Arabian Peninsula uh, has been home for many ancient civilizations in the past uh, centuries. Um, so the Arabian Peninsula also hosted um, the birthplace of Islam and the two holiest cities uh, in the Islam faith, Mecca and Medina. But what's interesting here, so, uh, the Arabian Peninsula historically has been a, a platform for trade between the Levant and Yemen. So we are in the, uh, in the process of 
um, creating and leveraging the, the unique position of, the, of Saudi Arabia and also uh, enabling trade amongst the neighboring countries. In the 1960s, uh, Saudi Arabia has uh, grown to um, a prominence in the world energy um, uh, field. Uh, accumulation, wealth accumulation has started and poured back into the economy in infrastructure, be it roads, be it seaports, be it uh, airports. In the past uh, 25 years, an average growth rate of 4% uh, is remarkable in any, uh, in any definition. I think what's um, uh, the main driver for the growth uh, the past 25 years has been primarily oil exports. And I think Saudi Arabia has tried in the past 45 years across nine uh, development uh, strategies to diversify away from, from oil um, with very limited success. Therefore, we needed to have a shock to the system. In 2016, His Royal Highness Crown Prince, Prince Mohammed bin Salman uh, announced Vision 2030. This is for us the guiding principle for any transformation that is taking place in Saudi Arabia. The, the Vision 2030 focuses on three strategic pillars. The first pillar is um, leveraging Saudi Arabia's position, position uh, at the heart of the Arab and Muslim world. Number two, leverage the wealth accumulation that took place in the past 30 years to um, leverage the Saudi position as an investment powerhouse. Third uh, strategic pillar is leverage our strategic location, geographical location, and use that to the benefit of Saudi Arabia and the world. Just to give you a quick brief on, of some of the some of the mega projects and giga projects uh, in Saudi Arabia. The first is Neom. It's a, a, a big uh, development in the northern part of Saudi Arabia. It's a futuristic um, entity or futuristic uh, development that covers 26,000 square kilometers. Um, based on uh, renewable energy, technology, and different, a truly different lifestyle. A Red Sea um, Development Company focuses on the development of a lot of um, uh, islands in the Red Sea, leveraging the unique uh, diving locations in the Red Sea, and also uh, the pristine shores of Saudi Arabia. Gidea is a big entertainment city that hosts one of the largest amusement parks, potentially largest amusement parks. Saudi Arabia just signed an MOU with Red Flags. Uh, anybody who's, uh, who's a fan of amusement parks would know definitely Red, fl uh, Red Flags. And also, in the coming two years, we will be concluding the largest metro development in the region, which is the Riyadh Metro, that covers 176 kilometers and worth more than 23 billion US dollars. Sorry. All of that contributed positively in the very early years of the Vision 2030 execution in doubling FDI in Saudi Arabia. So we've grown to 3.5 billion US dollars worth of FDI, doubling from the year previous year in just one year. Let's have a deep dive on logistics. So, uh, just going back to the third strategic pillar of our vision, leveraging our geographical location, we're looking at 10% of global trade passing through the Red Sea. F within five hours of flight, you can reach almost half of the world's population. Three hour flight, more than 300 million potential consumers. All of that is great potential that can be leveraged and utilized for the benefit of the world. Saudi Arabia has historically been a very important player in import-export. We're one of the largest co uh, countries in the world that imports and exports. We're also ranked 39th out of 140 countries in the World Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Report. Uh, last week, the World Bank issued a teaser about the ease of doing business. Uh, naming Saudi Arabia as one of the top 10 countries that has improved over one year. 
since the previous report. We've improved in nine dimensions, one of which is logistics. Uh, last point is facilitating import and export, Saudi customs, and we're going to talk about that in further detail later uh, in the presentation. Also within Saudi Arabia, we've created a national logistics committee that is headed by the Minister of Transport that involves and includes all of the government entities that are in charge or have a um, relationship with logistics. And we also created an advisory group from the private sector that we consult and we work with in order to ensure that we're not um, um, far away from their aspirations as well. Three main goals of the transformation, have Saudi Arabia as an export platform. Second point is create Saudi Arabia in a logistics, regional logistics hub. Last but not least, is enable a great supply chain system in Saudi Arabia that uh, helps and supports the previous two objectives. Um, some, of the, uh, some of the ongoing ambitions and, and projects, just to give you a sense of what's going on in Saudi Arabia, we've announced a logistics zone in King Khalid International Airport, which is in the middle, in the capital of Saudi Arabia. Um, we also launched already a logistics zone in King Fahad International Airport, which is in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia. We also, uh, before end of October, will be opening the new uh, port uh, land border with Iraq. And just imagine the potential um, trade that can take place between Saudi Arabia and Iraq and the whole region. And this has been closed since the Iraqi uh, invasion uh, to Kuwait 30-odd 30, uh, 30 years ago. Um, also, we've, we're upgrading our facilities. We just um, opened a, a new port or um, um, revamped uh, a port with, with Kuwait. And we also, last, last week, His Majesty King Salman uh, opened the largest international airport of Saudi Arabia in Jeddah which will also act as a logistics zone for, uh, for, the, for the region. From a, t from a sector quality perspective, we're also working on special economic zones. Um, the regulation is in process. We expect that the regulation will be announced within the coming six months. Also, liberalization of the postal sector. So historically, the, the government-owned uh, postal company used to be the regulator as well. Now it's separate. We have segregation of duties that will allow for future investment in the postal sector. Also privatization, and this is, here's a typo, it's not 30,000 square meters, it's actually 30 square kilometers. So it's a mega investment that will be open to the private sector. We already have uh, interest from the private sector to build completely this area. This area is the new border point with Iraq as well. So the border itself will be open before end of October, and this is a new logistics area, logistics development next and adjacent to the border. We also signed the tier agreement. I'm sure that most of you are aware uh, and know what the tier is. We've signed it. We're targeting before end of October as well. We'll be having the first tier shipment uh, from, the, uh, from Jordan to UAE to the Emirates via Saudi Arabia. Also, uh, the General Transportation Authority has developed a lot of technology platforms that allow for better visibility for potential investors in the trucking industry and, and the logistics by implementing multiple systems that uh, allow for the facilitation of truck movement across cities and within cities. Several achievements that took place as well. The, the Saudi Port Authority, uh, actually three days ago, um, announced uh, the launch of a truck appointment system that will allow for the facilitation of truck movement in and out of one of the largest ports. Um, this will allow for better productivity of trucking companies and logistics players. Um, just to give you an example, uh, one truck used to take several hours just to clear um, uh, just to go and wait for the container to be ready and leave. Now it takes less than 20 minutes for the round trip. That means better productivity for trucking, better productivity for logistics players. The General Transportation Authority also announced a lot of 
a lot of the regulation around uh, trucks to um, overhaul the, the transportation um, sector in Saudi Arabia and allow for future investment and better investment in that sector as well. Uh, the General Aviation Authority announced several privatization uh, initiatives for several airports that will allow for future development of logistics zones around airports. Uh, the Saudi Arabian Railway Company, and I think this is one of the major game changer for the whole region is the land bridge. Saudi Arabia currently connects the eastern province with the central capital via rail, but we lack connectivity, rail connectivity from the capital to the western province. So just imagine Saudi Arabia, you have a railroad from the Arabian Gulf to the Red Sea. They are evaluating, evaluating current proposals uh, as we speak. This will be a mega project um, that will be very, truly transformational. Saudi Customs, we've done a lot uh, in the past two years, and I'm going to go in further detail um, about Saudi Customs, and that's my, my personal comfort zone. So Saudi, uh, Saudi Customs has been in existence even before the reunification of Saudi Arabia uh, 89 years ago. Uh, we operate in 35 uh, ports, land, air, and sea, 10,000 employees, and we process more than 3 million customs declaration uh, per year. So we mentioned, uh, or I mentioned uh, several slides ago uh, about the tier, and before the end of October, we foresee that we will have the first shipment. We're working with our colleagues, our uh, trucking companies, and also our colleagues in Jordan Customs and UAE Customs to allow for the first tier um, uh, movement. Also, two years ago, we had zero submissions of customs declarations. Now we're 100% in just two years. This allowed for reducing the customs processing um, and clearance time by, um, by a considerable amount. It used to take eight, hour, eight days to clear goods from Saudi customs. Now, 80% of those who submit prior to arrival are cleared in less than 24 hours. We're still uh, very ambitious, and we see this number going down every, um, uh, every month. We also launched our national single window last year, in April 2018, that hosts 135 electronic services that enables importers and exporters and logistics players to interact with government via electronic means and a single window. We also, um, with, the, with the announcement of the new regulations of bonded zones, we allowed companies not registered in Saudi Arabia to leverage bonded zones and use bonded zones for the transshipment without necessarily require, uh, being required to uh, gain a commercial um, uh, registration. We also updated our bylaws. Historically, um, custom, uh, custom brokers were limited to individuals. Uh, now we expanded that, we allowed it for companies. We also allowed foreign investment companies to gain a uh, custom brokerage license. We also reduced the number of documentation required from, from 12 for imports and 9 for exports down to two for both imports and exports. And this all can be submitted electronically as well. We also established a targeting center. Uh, the targeting center allowed us to minimize manual inspection. And we're still eager to invest more in the targeting center to allow us to meet our regional and international benchmarks. Uh, as I mentioned before, all of that contributes positively to economic um, activity. We, ha we see a lot of investment coming into Saudi Arabia. We also announced bonded zones and bonded warehouses regulation uh, last year. And we see a lot of, uh, a lot of companies uh, interested in this. We also have some of our um, bonded zone operators in the, in the crowd today. I see them uh, in the crowd. And we also announced the authorized economic operator program. Uh, which is uh, a customs, uh, World's Customs Organization program that gives priority treatment for low-risk importers and exporters. 
Until this morning, we've signed up 101 companies, and we uh, look forward to expand to 150 companies before the end of 2019. We also signed uh, a mutual recognition agreement. This allows for companies enrolled in the program in Saudi Arabia to get preferential treatment as well in, in partner countries. So we signed the first one with the UAE, United Arab Emirates, and we foresee the Kingdom of Bahrain um, us signing together before the end of the year, and three additional countries in, uh, in, 2000, in the first half of uh, 2020. We, um, as I mentioned before, the truck appointment system just announced several days ago in King Abdelaziz port uh, in the eastern province uh, will be rolled out to uh, the, uh, all of uh, the congested ports within 2020. We also were the first customs authority to use blockchain and engage in TradeLens platform, which is an IBM Maersk line uh, platform. We've managed to help our largest petrochemical company, Sabic, to export and use blockchain to communicate and send secure data to our counterparts in the, in the Netherlands. So uh, it, was, uh, it was a great exercise. We learned a lot from this exercise and we see a lot of potential in, in leveraging blockchain. There's also part of the transformation in Saudi customs. We're changing minds, we're changing um, the, the mindset of our people. We're looking at our stakeholders as customers. Historically, we've seen them as just players that are important uh, in the region, uh, in Saudi Arabia, but without this customer sense, without this customer interest. So this is a major transformation in Saudi customs. Uh, some resistance here and there, but we're very eager to push through uh, this uh, change in mindset. We've established a 24 by 7 call center. Um, we respond to our, um, to our customers uh, in, in a great manner and um, a timely fashion. Last part of my presentation is about how we can work together. Uh, without great partners, nothing of this transformation would be achievable. I think the way I see it, we have two groups of freight forwarders in the, in the room, and the six players. Those who operate in Saudi Arabia, but they lack the service offering that they offer their own customers in other countries. And I think this is a great potential, great opportunity for, for them to expand their service offering. Second point for those who do not operate in Saudi Arabia, this is a great chance for you to obtain a license. We are on the verge of transformation. We see the initial numbers, we see the movement. A lot of, um, uh, a lot of companies have showed interest. We want people to get licenses. The logistics scene in Saudi Arabia is very fragmented. Without professional companies who will help us elevate the service offering and the service uh, availability and service levels in Saudi Arabia, we won't be able to achieve. I urge everybody who's interested to visit our booth in the exhibition hall and also to contact us via social media, via email. My staff and I will be available in the coming two days as well. Please talk to us. Let us know your, your, uh, your issues. Um, of course, not your personal issues. We're talking about logistics related only issues. So please talk to us because I'm going to take it on my shoulders. My, it's my responsibility to make things happen for you. Thank you so much, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. I hope um, and wish you all success. Thank you so much. Al Haqbani, before you leave the stage, please may I present to you a very small but delightful token of our appreciation for your warm welcome to Saudi Arabia this morning. And again, ladies and gentlemen, a warm round of applause. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, you've received your invitation and wow, just exponential growth on steroids as you watched that particular presentation. But more importantly, what the um, infrastructure had to meet and had to ensure kept moving within that particular region, as well as the hub that uh, the Emirates have uh, become. Ladies and gentlemen, um, there is stands downstairs um, that the Saudi Customs Authority has set up, so please do visit them down there as well. Our next presentation this morning begins to look at the future of global logistics and the supply chains, particularly in an age when you and I um, have to consider what technology, drones and mobility represent in how goods and trade is moved as well as are conducted. I'm pretty sure that all of you have heard the stories and the fortunes of the likes of the Amazon Goes and the different technologies that are now making sure that people don't have to wait six weeks anymore for a ship to move from port to port, but it in fact can come on an electronic pigeon, as it were. But ladies and gentlemen, the greater question for you now as the supply chain industry is to begin to ask, how do you convert? How do you integrate? And perhaps more importantly, how do you become part of this future through optimized and augmented products, solutions, as well as services in line with the type of demand that your consumers are asking for you today? Well, a man who's done a great body of work and research in making sure that you and I can begin to answer these questions today is Professor Wesley Harris. And he joins us here this morning as the Draper Professor of Aeronautics and Astronautics at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the United States of America. He has worked in a number of different roles um, at the Institute and has served particularly the study of aeronautics and astronautics um, quite significantly right throughout his academic career. So I'm really interested to hear that. Will we soon be flying products and goods to the moon? Please give him a very warm welcome to the stage this morning. Good morning, friends. I would like to thank, thank uh, Papa, <coughs> uh, the former presidents, uh, the board, uh, the extended board, Basel, uh, David, Isa, the elected officials that were with us this morning for this opportunity to spend time with you, to share some experiences, uh, to be educated, to be informed of the great work that's going on here uh, in uh, this community, uh, this world community, this international community. I would like to, to start with sharing with you a, a, a parable. There was a small community in which its leader, its person of wisdom, a woman, had led the community for many years. There was a need for succession. She was simply growing old. So she asked her direct reports to each send forward a person that they recommended to replace her. She invited those four recommended to replace her, to meet with her on a hill that overlooked the village. She asked each of the four the same question. Tell me if you were to look to the east, to the west, to the north, and to the south, what would you see? The first respondent said, when I look to the north, east, west, and south, I see the mountains, I see the rivers. The second said he saw only the animals. The third said he saw only the clouds. The fourth one said to the wise leader, when I look to the north, when I look to the south, to the east and to the west, 
I see the very same thing. The wise woman asked, well, what is that same thing? And the fourth person said, it is always, always change. The only constant on the landscape is change. That person, that fourth one, was selected to be the new leader. He saw change in every direction. Change is the constant on the landscape. It's not the reverse, it's not the clouds, it's not the forest or the trees, it's change. So out of respect for this community, my practice has been essentially in aeronautics. So when invited to this Congress, this international community, I took a step back and asked, what do I see? What do I see in this community? It's complex, it's layered, it's dynamic, it's interdependent, and it's loaded with stochastic elements. The complexity of what you do is second to no enterprise that I'm aware of. So when I see that complexity, I see opportunity for change. I see a way to make progress. I also see some immediate things that we all are aware of, that we should first make sure that this complex, this layered, this dynamic, this interdependent system with stochastic elements remain transparent. Visibility electronically through that system is absolutely critical. And I'll try to say a few things about that as we go through uh, the charts. Okay, so rush, rushing over from Boston to, to get here, I thought I would uh, take this cartoon with me. If you can read it, it says, uh, not Stanley, but Sam. Sam called to say he'd be late again. And the assistant is on the phone. The assistant says he lost his mind this morning. It took Sam 30 minutes to find it. So um, this complexity, guys, can lead to all sorts of interesting things, including uh, being 30 minutes late. So in seriousness, I would like to talk about an introduction. <clears throat> I would like to simplify technology and innovation. We pride ourselves in Cambridge and at MIT on innovation, entrepreneurship, um, venture capitalists, angels. We do all of that. We think we do it as well as any other community of our size. And then I want to reflect back on some experiences we've had at MIT in some very simple areas, but I want to give you the MIT perspective on it. What is it that we have learned about uh, supply chains? And how do you use supply chains to drive innovation, to, to bring new, effective, efficient ideas and concepts proven to your use? Okay, what is it about supply chains that, that's so wonderful in terms of innovation, okay, in terms of entrepreneurship, that really drives the business? A bit about trucks. And what is it about trucks that's so similar to wild geese? Okay, that's the idea about trucks. We know we can build trucks that are autonomous, but we want to go a bit further. And we look to nature, we look to wild geese and how they perform and bring that back to trucks. And this area of drones would follow. Um, again, the obvious, what can you do with drones in the port area? Uh, what can you do in terms of freight, freight delivery? And uh, a young man, um, <clears throat> his name is Arthur Brown from Canada, one of my graduate students. We worked on a problem where we developed um, an idea on paper of how to use drones to transfer large items, like a half ton of, of mass or weight, um, over an industrial area. And then I'll have some closing comments. Okay, some of you are perhaps a little bit younger than I am, but so let me go back to when I was at the age of the young uh, South Africans who were here this morning. 
When I was their age, the earth was round. It was green, it was cool, and very sparsely populated. Okay, that wasn't that long ago. But today, the earth is flat, flat by, flattened by electrons. It's getting brown, meaning that there's an environmental impact that's negative. And it's certainly hot. Temperatures continue to rise, and it's overpopulated. What that has done, one, one of the things it's done, is to really change our brains, our minds, and how we think and act. You know, electrons are always with us. Um, I don't know when I, I remember without electrons. So my whole way of thinking and grabbing hold of my environment and all that's around me has been changed over time. When that change in my brain occurred, it also provides an opportunity. It says that I now am able to engage large quantity of high quality data. Not only can I engage with it, but I can use it. I can use it to the advantage of the environment, of humanity, and of course, of my business. My brain has changed along with the earth, and that change has brought an opportunity, an opportunity to use that bring those electrons to do other things. So up on the rock in Boston, when we say technology and innovation, we reduce it to three simple principles. First, we need an idea, an idea that does not violate physics, <clears throat> an idea that won't break the bank, an idea that is executable an idea that is testable, an idea that is scalable, sustainable, transferable. And once we have that idea, we then go to the next point of implementation. And notice that implementation is in every farm. Implementation is hard. It's hard. We have ideas up to Gazoo every single day. But implementation is the real challenge. It usually requires significant Investments, investments in time, people, fiscal resources, our natural resources, all must come together. And then we can't get down and move on until we've quantified the impact. We've actually done an assessment. Uh, and this, this one, two, three, sometimes can cycle around several times until we get the impact that we want. But that's what we do when we, go, when we talk about innovation and entrepreneurship and angels and capital investment in Cambridge and MIT. Three things, idea, implementation, and impact. Now, hidden in all of that is the following. Now, technology is, is a good thing, <clears throat> but it is only a building block. It's not the holy grail in itself. It's just one piece. It is only a building block. It will not drive your business outcomes. It will not have impact. You cannot implement it in the absence of a more holistic transformation of the total business enterprise. We must have new ways of doing business. We must upskill our personnel. We must eliminate waste, eliminate waste, eliminate waste. We must develop and maintain timely and accurate data, big data, big data. Okay. These are important, just as important as the, the technology tools that, that we usually associate with um, innovation. Okay, so you get many pretenders that come to you as a wolf in sheep clothing. Be aware. Uh, do not let anyone promise you something that is not deliverable. Uh, it happens all the time. Um, that requires an organization to determine if you have a wolf in sheep clothing. It's not a one person kind of uh, way of doing business. You must ask the right questions. Uh, every proposal that you get that claims innovation will take you to X when you are currently at Y. So be aware of that. Okay, it's, it's, it's a body of people that can only evaluate whether the wolf is there, or the sheep is there, or is the wolf in sheep clothing. 
All right, supply chains. Over the years, we were asked to help the U.S. Air Force develop <coughs> the C-17 aircraft. The C-17 is a big airplane that transports tanks, personnel, etc., all over the world. It's the newest transport that the U.S. Air Force has. So it was initially designed by a company that no longer exists, McDonnell Douglas, which was sold or bought by Boeing. The airplane itself was uh, in, caught in a lawsuit. McDonnell Douglas was suing the Air Force. The Air Force officers were suing McDonnell Douglas. MIT was asked to step in to try to settle this and in a way that both parties win, a win-win solution. It turned out that the most important thing was something called <clears throat> economic incentives in terms of an order of products or parts, but it was a way of getting money to McDonnell Douglas in such a way that McDonnell Douglas could use that money to reduce the costs of the airplane. Well, how do you reduce the cost of an airplane? You've got to change the processes of how they actually make it. What's important in that process was the supply chain. The supply chain. So what McDonnell Douglas did, and continued by Boeing, was to certify their suppliers. Certify their suppliers. To build a big airplane like that, you have hundreds of suppliers, and everyone Every swinging Joe wants to be a supplier, wants to build parts for McDonnell Douglas or Boeing to go into that airplane. Well, that's not a good way of doing business to have them all at the gate at the same time. So we recommended that the Air Force certify their suppliers. That is, there's an agreement, a contract on quality, quality, quantity, and time delivery, all data driven. This impacted personnel at McDonnell Douglas and at Boeing. It impacted the inventory. When you see the word inventory, that means money. You don't want a large inventory. It impacted tools, the demand for new tools, cash flow, customer satisfaction, that is the Air Force, and obviously the project margins. Well, how did <coughs> McDonnell Douglas to get this started. McDonnell Douglas called the certified the suppliers in. He said, look guys, we will provide you with economic incentives if you improve quality, quantity, and delivery. Okay. Upfront capitalization, money, was given to the suppliers in order that they improve and that they invent, that they invent, not just replace, but they invent. A second possibility, which we did not recommend, was after McDonnell Douglas sold the airplane, or copies of it, they would then provide a profit back to the suppliers. Um, but this was one way in which the supply chain was respected. It was a way to drive innovation. It was a way to drive a, a technology input that was based on quality, quantity, and, and a timely delivery which also meant that you don't need a person at the loading dock to evaluate quality of incoming products. That's a reduction in personnel. And this, doesn't, this model applies to all of us, not just to those who are building airplanes. If you have to buy tires for your truck, why not certify your suppliers? Based on data, you want quality, quantity, and time to deliver. And this cartoon sort of captures that, and the, the charts will be available for all of you. But procurement, you have to ask for, order what you want. Um, they have to be manufactured. The warehousing, the inventory piece is uh, <coughs> critically important. Where you get a uh, warehouse them, and of course, transport them back to uh, the point where you will need those parts. So this is a lean supply chain for management. Okay. It's not exclusive for companies who manufacture things, okay? So it's, it's for you. You don't manufacture things, you move things, big things, and small things. 
but by any business who want to streamline their processes by eliminating waste and non-value-added activities. Big savings. All right, what, I have not, what we didn't talk about at MIT, I mean, the supply chain is a big business and there are many elements. <clears throat> this approach that we had focused on parts, not pipeline, not the terminal or the ha uh, harbor, not the ports or rails, not the roads, bridges, and airports, distribution centers, or border crossings, nor the military, but the guts and heart, the, the complexity uh, of the aircraft. So the quantification is important as you go forward to understand how to capture the advantages of certifying your suppliers. How do geese fly? How do geese fly? If, if you're from North America, you, the wild geese fly at certain seasons. If you pay attention to, to wild geese when they fly, there's always one geese in the lead. And you point the geese who's in the lead, then they sort of trail off behind. Why did they do that? Do they have big data? Uh, do they have uh, artificial intelligence? Why do geese do that? It, it turns out that the lead geese is the one that suffers most. The lead geese is the one that has the greatest headwind. And that geese has to overcome that headwind. When that geese does that, there's a wick that is generated behind that geese. And those that are in the wake have less drag, less of a force that retards their motion. If you follow geese migrating over a long distance, the head geese always drops back and another comes up to take its place because the head geese can't go forever taking the heavy slow, so they rotate. So we ask ourselves, what can we do with our autonomous trucks? We know we can build trucks with no person driving them. We can drive them through Boston autonomously and have done that. But that's only one advantage. It takes the driver, the person out of the equation. But what about fuel savings? What about timely delivery? With trucks and platoons, they act like wild geese. The lead truck is the one that takes the load. The other trucks falling behind have less of a headwind, use less fuel, and therefore a significant savings. So we worked this out. We've actually tested this. Uh, this photograph is obviously in a very cold region. There's ice on the roads, but it works everywhere. Now, you might ask yourself, what is the <clears throat> wolf and sheep clothing. Well, I haven't said anything about how many trucks, right? Will two work? Yes. Will five work? Well, we aren't so sure. If you can get five to work, can you get five trucks and queue to go into the same place at the same time, right? So you have to go through all those calculations in order to be quite comfortable with driverless trucks behaving in a um, platoon faction. But I'll list some of the advantages that come out of that. Drones, drones, drones. This was a great promise. <clears throat> and this, uh, this cartoon, this chart shows uh, drones over a very densely populated area. Okay. Um, the challenge is, is always in an urban area for, for drones, drones that are, that are above the, uh, the skyscrapers. Uh, the challenge in an open uh, plane is, is interesting, but, but not like, like the drones here. So let's talk about these drones for a moment. They come in various shapes. This is a very simple one. Uh, you cannot lift a half ton with that particular configuration. Um, in addition to its limitation in terms of lift capability, um, it has four propellers, and that usually is a no-no. Okay. That usually signals noise, which you don't, which you cannot tolerate in an urban area. Now, these are drones. Right? These are autonomous vehicles. Um, <clears throat> the big one on the left, uh, second from the left, is the uh, C-5 that took humans to the moon in the uh, late 60s. <clears throat> The one third from the left is uh, the space shuttle, which had its run. It's no longer useful. And the new, one, the one on the right, 
far, far right is. Um, <coughs> SpaceX proposal um, to take humans to the moon and uh, to Mars. Now, these devices incur a lot of things. They have no use to us, right? We want, we're primarily in a two-dimensional, maybe four-dimensional world, but not in a world where we are interested in anything of that capability. But they are drones, but not our drones. These are not our drones. So we don't want to go there. We don't want to get stuck in some Buck Rogers, uh, uh, pie in the sky kind of conversation. We're going to stay close within Earth's atmosphere. So this is a cartoon of what may go on at some of your docks. Some of you uh, may have uh, an opportunity to engage ships. <clears throat> and there are issues of security, inspection, mapping, uh, traffic management, personnel management, and inventory control. All of which can be done today, today, with drones. Drones appropriately instrumented much better than those two personnel that you see in that chart and all the heavy boom equipment and scaffolding that goes on. In fact, you could do this with drones and with sensors 24 hours a day, seven days a week without interrupting any other activity on your port. So enormous savings are available today. Now, if you do this, if you were to set up a drone system with sensors, <coughs> Those two people that you see there would be replaced by a bank of IT experts, probably a dozen, that would man your systems, uh, your drones, would make sure your sensors are working appropriately, would take that data from the sensors and put it in a form where you can use it, not just electrons, but actually use for data. For example, crack propagation on the hull of that ship. That's the kind of data you want. Those two men standing there can't get you that data. Set it up without great work. But with a drone, you can do it very quickly. A drone with appropriate sensors. So there are enormous opportunities for drones if on the ground at the port itself. Not mentioned in that chart, that cartoon, is what about trucks at your port? Um, the big um, port in Virginia, at Virginia Beach, Norfolk, and trucks can get in the way of trucks. Trucks can get in the way of trucks. How do you manage that? How do you get that squared away? When trucks get in the way of trucks, that's money lost. That's time that you can never, ever recover. That impacts your delivery. That impacts your customer. Well, with drones, you can monitor the motion and location of trucks 24-7. You can coordinate with them, especially if they are autonomous, to get them in a queue where they're all moving at their most efficient rate. So another application of drones on the ground with, uh, with trucks. OK, so what are some of the challenges of drones? <coughs> Sensors. Sensors, sensors, sensors. What do you want to measure? And how much does it cost to build that sensor? How much does data do you need uh, to make sense of what you measure? How many people do you need to man those systems? Power, power, power. Uh, drones, all, most all of them these days, run on batteries. Um, what's the energy density of your battery? How do you improve that, therefore improve the life and effectiveness of your drone. Depending upon how your airspace is managed by the federal government, the local government, uh, or do you have all control at your own location, but airspace control can be a challenge in using drones. As I said earlier, in urban areas, noise. Drones with propellers just make noise, guys. And people who live in the city, and even those who work in the city, do not like another noise source. The monitoring systems level, the complexity there has to be faced. It's not just a drone flying by itself, but there's a system behind it. And maintenance. You know, drones, airplanes have to be repaired. Moving parts, 
Okay, again, back to the supply chain again. So that's, that's a big challenge. But if done, you've got 24 seven of quality service available. All right, so this is Arthur Brown. This is a paper that Arthur and I um, presented at the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics and, um, uh, in Florida in 2018. We, we designed uh, and optimized a model for urban air mobility. We did this uh, with people in mind, but then it occurred to us that if we didn't have people, we'd have even a greater advantage. A greater advantage. <coughs> if we didn't have people and if we were limited to freight as opposed to moving people. So we worked this out and we had a test case. We asked ourselves, what if we were to move freight from JFK Airport in New York to downtown on West 30th Street? And let's do it in the most direct route. Let's move that freight across Brooklyn, all right? across a populated area. That is on the left side. We did another calculation of moving the same freight from the same location, JFK, along the water routes, but not over populated areas. Okay, up the Hudson, onto east, onto the East River, and East 34th Street. So we have two comparisons. And the reason we did the two comparisons was we were very sensitive to noise. Going the direct route, shortest, less fuel, less time required, but you're going to upset people in their homes. So the, the second comparison was, or uh, the second calculation was, to go along the water routes. So we know what penalty we must pay or would pay if we were to use these drones uh, in terms of the noise penalty. Could we actually do it? So we convinced ourselves that we could do it, the calculations, Um, this obviously is not JFK, but the point I want to make here is container size, depending upon the actual weight of them, are the kinds of items you can move with drones. These are not the little drones that uh, Amazon use. These are, these are big, useful, industrial quality drones. All right, so if you look at drones as a, an aircraft, you ask, what is the range of your aircraft? How do I know I can get from JFK to downtown Manhattan? What is the range? The range depends upon four factors. The lift produced by the drone, the drag divided by the drag, that is the resistance to motion to horizontal flight. You multiply that by the efficiency of the battery use. Okay, no, no kerosene, no jet fuel, we are building drones that use batteries to move them. And then the denominator, the critical guy, is the weight, the drone weight, which consists of the actual structural weight as well as the weight of the container that you're traveling. So this is a very simple piece of algebra, guys. Put it in your back pocket. If someone wants to sell you a drone and tell you they, uh, they can take 10,000 um, pounds, uh, 50 kilometers, Hey, if, if this doesn't work, if, if this says no, then you know you have a wolf in sheep clothing. So all the analysis comes down to something very simple, right? Very, very simple, but useful. So what are some of the opportunities and what are some of the challenges if you try to deliver freight by a, an autonomous drone? No person in the vehicle at all. Everything is done by, by robots or autonomously. The opportunities are to reduce costs, to reduce time to delivery, to reduce environmental impact, and to have the capability to transport on demand. If there's an item that you want to get to downtown Manhattan in 15 minutes or a big box, a freighter, a, a, a container, you can do it if you have this kind of capability. The challenges are similar to the ones we talked about earlier, system maintenance, noise level, and public assess, acceptance. Will the public want to see drones flying about and there's no pilot in it, it's all done autonomously. So in closing, 
Technology and innovation is good, but it's not the holy grail. You've got to have a total transformation of your enterprise to take advantage of it. Don't forget the three I's, the idea, the tough one, implementation, and you are bound to provide an assessment that is to determine the impact of your idea. Nearly everything that we have experienced up on the rock suggests that upfront investments are critical. You need more time, more people, more money, more pieces. It's not a free one. There are returns to investment, substantial, but upfront is going to be a piece that you have to deal with. The fourth bullet, the future is data driven. And others this morning have spoken to this point. We have the capability to, to absorb good data, quality data, and we can absorb large quantities of it. Your competitors, <clears throat> as we speak, is collecting data, and they will eat your lunch if you don't have data. Banks aren't going to shake hands with you because you smile anymore. They want to know what's the data and what's the payoff. How do you demonstrate your claim? You can't do that without high quality and high volume data. And the last bullet on this chart, and last thing I have to say, this enterprise, this complex, this layered, this interdependent, this complex device with stochastic elements will continue to grow. I would say it will flourish if and only if it decides how it learns. This organization must decide how it learns. <clears throat> um, Basil spoke on education, how it's changing. No. He, he grabbed a hold of this constant in the landscape called change. This piece here, how does this organization, how does the author learn? How do you collect data? How do you analyze data? How do you share data? Does, does, is there any one of you who collects data on performance and sends it back to headquarters where it is analyzed and shared with all members of Fiat, Fiat. How do you learn? You cannot or you won't flourish until you learn how to learn. This organization must be a learning organization. You've got to have that as a part of your soul. You must have a mechanism for learning and sharing and sharing. Thank you. I loved your closing slide, Professor Harris, because at the heart of digital transformation for all of us is how do we ultimately convert all of these processes, all of these people in making um, a worthy impact in all of our spaces. So thank you very much for sharing the insights and looking at some of the really interesting but often scary and intimidating um, prevalence of technology and the different spaces that it may take from us but it may also give to us this morning and we appreciate it. This is a small token of appreciation to you for the insights that you have shared with us this morning. Thank you. Please give them again a warm round of applause. Well, ladies and gentlemen, in the room here today, I am almost certain that there is no shortage of skills, of thought leadership, as well as data. But for many of us, whilst we grapple with the demands of our customers, our companies, our own people, these robust and interesting changes, evolutions, and even the Kodak moments of all of our industries barely have the space, let alone the time, to sit down and meaningfully unpack what all of these drivers actually mean in our businesses, to meaningfully unpack what profitability, productivity actually means to us in an age of evolution as we're hearing today. But perhaps more importantly, 
give us our space to start to think about where do our next investments go? Do they go into skills, into new infrastructure, new technologies, radical experiments that will change the way the world experiences logistics and supply chain? Well, the next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, on our program has a good idea of how we begin to join some of these dots, but also has a far bigger idea around when you and I are called to make the investment decisions that will help us drive value, that will help us drive impact, where it is that we need to look, and more importantly, where we need to focus ourselves. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is Ms. Celeste Faulkner. She joins us today from the Global Markets Research Team at Rand Merchant Bank, where she's one of the chief economists, in fact, um, in this particular di division. And she runs a team that not only wins a great many awards for the type of work that they do, not just in sub-Saharan Africa, but right the way around the world, but also a team that makes sure it keeps its hand on the pulse of where to invest, the different movements, the different shakers in our spaces, and I certainly hope that each of you derive great value from where she is going to point us to on this voyage of discovery. Please give her a very warm round of applause. Thank you very much. Um, President Badat, thank you very much for having me here today to FIATA. Um, Mr. Peterson, also from the South African part, thank you very much for having us. Um, we are proud to be a sponsor um, of this, one of the sponsors of the event, um, First National Bank, and I'm specifically from the investment banking leg um, of our sister company, so, which is called <laughs> RMB. So I have been told or asked to come and present on where to invest in Africa. And if I look now, I've got 34 minutes left to speak about 54 countries on the continent. So it's a very difficult task, and that is why I'm going to keep it as high level as possible and just highlight to you that this presentation is based on a document that we write annually, and that has all the information there available. And this year's specific document, the 2019 version, is focused on infrastructure. So it's actually an ideal topic uh, for the, the conference that we have today. I'm also very well aware I'm standing, I'm the only person standing between you and your lunch, so I won't go over time. Uh, we also won't have time for questions and answers, but I will also be available over the lunch time to discuss um, uh, the topic. So where to invest in Africa? Very big question to ask. So I'll give a bit of an overview. How do we look at investing on the continent? The two specific ways we've decided as economists and businessmen and women going onto the, into the continent is looking at where's the economic activity. So basically, where's your largest markets from a dollar term perspective? Those are your Nigeria, South Africa's, Egypt's. And then also, where are we going to see the strongest growth rates over the next few years? So we are, we are very well aware that some of the African countries are now the fastest growing economies in the world. And then of course we have to look at the operating environment and that is where logistics plays a significant part here. How easy is it to do business in Africa? So how easy is it to get your, your goods from point A to point B, so logistics and supply chains? And then also other aspects. How easy is it to get your money in to these African economies? But the, the most difficult one, I think, is how to repatriate your money out of these economies. So what we've done from that methodology perspective, we look at the market size, as I've mentioned, and your economic growth, and that is 50% of our ranking. And then we look at your business environment surveys globally. So we have already heard how we all have been discussing the World Economic Forum's competitiveness report or the World Bank's Doing Business Report. And these are two key surveys that we use in our own rankings. We also look at the Corruption Perception Index. Uh, we are very well aware that our continent is definitely one of the weaker players when it comes to these surveys. And then of course, Economic Freedom by the Heritage Foundation. So we combine that, that's another 50% of our methodology. And there you go, there's our rankings. So we do have a lot of critique on this type of ranking, 
but we are very well aware that we cannot encompass all types of issues of doing business in any type of country into only one ranking. So that is why within the publication that you will have access to, there are different combinations of these rankings. But I'm going to highlight now the key rankings of the survey. So the winner is Egypt. Now, three years ago, we have been writing this document for nine years already. Three years ago, South Africa was number one. So much to my dismay, I am a South African. We slipped down the rankings two years ago, last year, and again, the latest version, the 2020 version, which have been published to our clients last week. We have now slipped to number three spot. I am showing you the 2019 rankings, and that is what is available to you at the moment, and I'll highlight why South Africa is also slipping down these ranks. But I think my, my esteemed colleague and our Member of Parliament um, has already explained that we have been dropping down the business ranking surveys. But why is Egypt number one? And then we see a country like Morocco, for instance. Your North African countries featuring predominantly um, in these surveys. Tunisia has just fell off the list of the top ten. It is because out of the African con continent, and excluding South Africa, these North African nations are the most diversified on our continent. Not only do they have commodities like oil and gas, but they've also invested heavily into the manufacturing sector and also the agricultural sector. And then an economy like Morocco is, is moving up the ranks of being one of the best financial sectors in Africa. Moving over to South Africa, the reason why we've slipped down the rankings is also not because of our operating environment slipping in the global surveys, but mainly because of our economic performance. We have seen a, a growth rate of about 0.5% for the past two years, and unfortunately, it's probably not going to grow by 1% in the next three years. Now, there's lots of reasons behind this and, and which can be discussed later, but that's the key reason why we are slipping down the ranks. So us as a country needs to start taking example for countries like Saudi Arabia, for instance, how they've changed their business environment to be able to get more investment into the continent or into the country. And we are starting to see that happen. I want to also highlight countries in East Africa. Now, East Africa is going to be the major growth driver for the continent in the next decade, 100%. The reason for this is because we are seeing significant infrastructure investment surrounding your manufacturing sector and obviously surrounding the resources sector. So East Africa has discovered oil and gas, and that is why we are seeing investment flowing into these markets. But also what has been standing the East African community in good stead is its regional integration. The EAC, which is the East African Community, um, is an economic integration and also your trade integration, which has been one of the best performing regional economic communities in Africa. If we can just spur that integration over the next few years, not just in East Africa, but from an African Continental Free Trade Agreement perspective, we will see significant growth rates on the continent. And ladies and gentlemen, I truly do believe that this African Continental Free Trade Agreement is the next best thing, the silver bullet for African growth over the next few years. And I also do believe it will be one of the best, better performing free trade agreements than what we have seen in history. The reason why I'm saying this is because all presidents have signed the agreement before they negotiated what is in the agreement. Usually with, with these free trade agreements, you first negotiate and then you sign. So now, all 54 presidents are very well aware that they've signed it, so now they need to make it work. And specifically with South Africa being the host or the chair of the AU next year, the African Union, I do believe that our own president will go to its trade department and say, this needs to work. It will take many years, but it will get there. Then if, if we move on to countries, as I've mentioned, in East Africa, we see a country, for instance, like Ethiopia in the top 10. Now, we've had many clients asking us, why is Ethiopia, Ethiopia in the top 10? Especially as it's one of the countries where you cannot repatriate your dollars out of that market. Well, cannot is a strong word. We are starting to see changes. And we are starting to see, my, see some of our clients who are active in that economy starting to repatriate their hard currency. But what we need to highlight with these top 10 economies is that we also envisage what is going to happen over the next few years. 
Now, Ethiopia, for instance, is a very good example of a country that is now going to start opening up its borders to international investment. It has to. Ethiopia is known as the fastest growing economy in Africa, and for the past few years, it was one of the top 10 fastest growing economies in the world. That growth rate, yes, it came from a very low base, but it is now starting to become more sustainable. And the reason for this is heavy government investment into its own industries, agriculture, telecommunications, retail. But with that and the heavy spending from the government, we've unfortunately seen that the government's debt levels have increased significantly and is potentially going to reach an unsustainable level. So the new government, very pro-business, is very well aware of these debt levels, so they need to open up their markets to external investment, and we have seen that already happening. Equity has been offered in its telecommunications company. We have seen how they are getting skills from different countries to come and teach them how to change their business environment to make it more conducive for international investment. Other countries worth mentioning, a country, country like Rwanda, Rwanda is in the top five easiest business environments in Africa. It is, in fact, the fastest reforming economy in the world over the past decade with reforming its business environment. We do know Rwanda is a very small economy. So sometimes it should not really be in our top 10 if you are looking for market size. But you can open up a business online in 24 hours very easily. You also, if you base your headquarters there, you've got access to the East African community. So not just the 12 million people in Rwanda. Then also that I need to highlight, there are some caveats to our rankings, as I've mentioned earlier. A country like Tanzania, here it is in our top <coughs> 10. And the reason for this is because, yes, it is showing strong growth rates. It is now one of the biggest markets in the East African region, but unfortunately, the business environment is also starting to slip down the ranks. And in the new 2020 rankings, we have in fact seen it slip out of the top 10. And that is mainly because of government intervention and involvement into your key industries like the gold sector. Moving over to uh, West Africa, so we see that Nigeria, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire are the last ones in our top 10. Very briefly there were those economies. Nigeria, for instance, we have seen strong growth rates in the past 15 years. It's got almost 200 million people and it is expected to be the largest population in the world in, in 2040-2050. Also, we see Ghana, a country that's also discovered oil recently and started producing and now it's one of its main export revenue earners. Cote d'Ivoire, also a country that has discovered oil and gas, that's also like Ghana, a large cocoa producer. These countries, all three that I've mentioned now, and the, the, the highlighting of the commodities is that, unfortunately, West Africa and most of the continent is still very dependent on what happens to commodity prices. I don't think that's something that we are going to get away from anytime soon. For the past 20 years, we've been talking about Africa needs to diversify. It's moving into the right direction. It's the last frontier for investment. It's got a burgeoning middle class. Unfortunately, we have seen in the past five years that the pace of this noise or this gossip and this excitement, it's unfortunately been too fast compared to the actual implementation of the, this diversification on the continent. We are still, well, I still believe, and us as a bank still believes that Africa is the last frontier. We continue to expand our banking business there because we do believe this is the area of, of investment and significant growth. Nigeria again with oil prices. If you can predict where oil prices are going, I don't know, where's my Saudi friends? Where's the oil price going? If we can predict where that is going, you can predict where Nigeria is going. And um, for instance, your oil price dropped below 50 um, two years ago. Um, we immediately saw the economy going into a recession and we saw a massive devaluation in the currency. So don't be surprised if you do see the economy battling again, if we do see your oil prices going below 60 or below $55 per barrel. That is not our base case, and that's why Nigeria is still in our top 10. We believe that oil price will be maintained between that 60 to $70. But as I mentioned, if not, 
Nigeria can easily slip out of this top 10. And it just shows you how fickle these economies still are in Africa, and that is the risk we really need to highlight. I think I've said enough about the top 10 because there's still a few um, aspects that I want to mention. Uh, other countries that have moved within and without the top 10. A good example here is a country like Zambia. We've seen significant South African corporate investment into a country like Zambia. You've got a large population, the demand was strong a few years back, but unfortunately we have seen with the copper price, once again a commodity, with the copper price going down over the past few years, we've seen Zambia taking stray. We've also seen some government intervention, specifically into the copper sector. And we're also seeing significant influence uh, from the Chinese um, going into the market. Now, when I'm saying influence, um, we, I do get a lot of questions. Do we believe China is colonizing Africa? No, they're not colonizing Africa. Um, they're definitely helping Africa with its growth rates, building infrastructure. But I need to highlight there are countries where we are seeing the negative effects of heavy investment um, by Chinese governments. And I think Zambia is definitely one to mention here. Zambia at the moment is now ranked 17th. Now, the, the fact that Zambia is still in our top 20 is quite surprising for me at the moment because we are seeing a country battling significantly with their fiscal uh, position. Uh, their debt levels are increasing significantly. They are not allowing or wanting the IMF to come in to support them. So we've seen debt levels rising. We are starting to see that the mining sector is starting to feel the effects. And even recently, we've seen that the electricity outages have now been increased to eight hours per day. So this economy is really battling at the moment. To mention again from a Chinese perspective, what are the risks if Zambia does not take financing from any other institution like an IMF and rather focuses on the support from a Chinese government, for instance? It just makes a, a, a one country very dependent on the actions of another country. And let's say China has a hard landing with its econ economic growth rates. Again, not our core view at all. But what if we see economic growth plummet in China, we will see the immediate effects on a country like Zambia. So that is the, the major risk that we need to highlight. Another country that used to be in our top 20 is in Mozambique, for instance. Unfortunately, this country, a few years back, did not divulge all the debt that they had on their balance sheet. And um, when it was exposed, we saw donor funding being extracted from the economy. We saw the IMF also exiting out of the economy. Um, and then, of course, um, this year we've seen significant effects, um, weather conditions like the two cyclones that hit the economy. So at the moment, unfortunately, Mozambique is struggling. And that's why it's not in our top 20 at the moment. But I'm telling you, in the next few years, we are going to see significant foreign direct investment flooding into that market. And the reason for this is you've got still a very strong coal industry. And yes, even though coal prices are not as strong as it used to be due to environmental issues specifically, um, we also see that um, the, the sector is still growing with investment. And then they have discovered oil and gas, specifically that gas sector, which will come online in the next five years. So we do see that this economy will once again be boosted and that they will be able to start repaying that debt. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, two or three other countries that, uh, that I would like to mention before I go into the rest of the presentation. Countries like number 12 and number 13, Mauritius and Botswana, number 21, which is Namibia. These three economies are probably some of your easiest economies to invest in in Africa. Better rated than South Africa from a sovereign ratings perspective. But then the question is why are they not in our top 10? If we go back to the methodology, yes, it is easy to do business there, but the growth rates in most of Southern Africa, and specifically those three economies, have been uninspiring over the past few years, like we've seen with South Africa. And unfortunately, these three economies only have about 5 million people together in all three economies. So still very small market sizes. So the opportunities are slightly less in those economies. That's why they are not in our top 10. 
I'm actually going to just briefly go through the regional GDP growth profile for Africa. As you can see here, we're comparing it to the rest of the world, and we can see that over the next few years, we will be growing above the world's average, um, and we will be the second fastest regional um, economy in, Af oh, in, the, in the world. Um, obviously, that is um, below emerging and developing Asia. So the, the opportunities are still there. The prospects and the risks that is now associated, associated to, the, to this five-year view, your prospects, we still have natural resources, some of the most probably in the world. And the one key area I think that is going to be exposed as a key investment area over the next decade is agriculture. Not just because finally Africa is taking hold of that technology to be able to grow these industries, and we're starting to see uh, governments realizing this is an industry we really need to harness and improve on. So we are seeing investment there. Um, I do believe it's because of global demand for nutritional goods are increasing, specifically from countries like India and China. And where are the easiest areas to get it from? Africa. It's still the cheaper area. Labor costs are still very cheap. Um, so I believe Af this is going to be Africa's I don't want to say silver bullet again, but this is going to be one of the golden opportunities for investment over the next few years. We still have those demographics, even though I've mentioned the big hype that was made about the middle class burgeoning um, and the, the dynamics that we are seeing from a youth perspective and the growth rates in our population. Um, even though it hasn't grown as fast as what was expected, um, the demographics is still a key prospect for the African con uh, continent. And even though we are still a very difficult continent to do business in, we are definitely seeing significant improvements from certain pockets um, of excellence. A country like Rwanda, for instance, um, a very nice mention here, and it's a country we hardly ever speak about, is a country called Djibouti. Um, in fact, Djibouti has moved 55 spots in the latest World Bank rankings. Improvement. In simply in one year, this government has decided that we need to make it easy to do business in our, in our environment and they've moved up 55 spots. That's as simple as it can be. And then of course, just highlighting revenue collection. Um, we had our own revenue collection authorities here today. Um, South Africa has the strongest revenue collection authorities. Unfortunately, the rest of Africa really is um, not um, well developed. And I think this is a key area for fiscal, um, fiscal consolidation in most of these African countries is revenue collection. If you just uh, have a, a strong authority to be able to do that, improve your technology, and then another key factor is moving your informal sector into the formal sector, and then we are going to see significant improvements in revenue collection. With that, I need to highlight the risks. Because the revenues are not flowing as freely as it did many years back when commodity prices were still very high, or in its super cycle of 2011, um, we have seen that debt levels have been rising. Countries have not been spending less over these lean years. They've been spending more. With that, we have seen weak credit growth because obviously we are not seeing um, investment into the financial sectors as it should be, and that is why we have seen a significant drop in your credit growth. This has now started to change, and we have seen it bottom, which is a positive. But from all of these perspectives, I'm talking about governments needing to invest into their sectors, but how can they invest when they do not have money? And that's where we need the private sector to step in. Um, I'm, the last few slides that I'm going to show you, I'm going to go through very quickly. These are the countries that we are going to see the fastest growth rates over the next five years. So new names there that you might not know, Benin, Somalia, we all know Somalia, but did we ever think it will grow this fast? Um, a Djibouti that I've just mentioned earlier. Just to highlight with those countries I've just highlighted, they still the growth is still coming from a very low base and can easily change within a year. The ones that are sustainable and that we've seen over the past decade growing at a faster pace, Senegal, we've seen Cote d'Ivoire, Rwanda, Tanzania, all your East African countries featuring quite nicely here. And then from a market size perspective, so who has the most dollars in these markets? Um, we do know that Egypt and Nigeria, they're always on par. And um, just to highlight, this is in purchasing power terms. 
So we actually equaling your currencies basically, comparing apples with apples. Um, and Egypt is number one. If we had to look at real GDP in dollar terms, Nigeria is the largest economy in Africa. South Africa is number three. But we started to see countries like Morocco and Algeria moving up um, to be some of your larger economies um, on the continent. And then just lastly, from our methodology perspective, who's the best business environments and who are the worst? So we can see here that Mauritius is your most favorable business environment in Africa. So lots of reasons for this. Um, they've got significantly strong special economic zones. Um, I didn't mention the first one that everybody always thinks of. It's a tax haven um, for, for certain businesses. <clears throat> um, but we're also seeing that um, they are starting to improve um, paperwork, as, we, as uh, my Saudi, Saudi counterparts have mentioned, and trying to decrease the paperwork for doing trade in these economies. Um, in Mauritius, um, a country like um, Seychelles, all your smaller economies that really need investment have started improving their business environments quite significantly. And then the bottom five, um, we can see their names that um, are very familiar to us in, in the sense of very risky business environments. Uh, Sudan, uh, Congo, and then, um, apologies, the bottom one should be South Sudan. So these are your favorable operating environments, but what are the three key most problematic factors for doing business in Africa? The top two, liquidity. So liquidity, we talk here about, again, your, your finance. Is it easy for your client to pay you? Um, do they have access to hard currency or even local currency to pay you? And is it easy for yourselves to be able to repatriate your hard currency out of these markets? That is the number one most problematic factor for doing business in Africa. It's not politics anymore. Um, people are very well aware that uh, politics, yes, is still in the top ten most um, problematic factors for doing business in Africa. But it's now real tangible business environment problems. Infrastructure is the second biggest drawback to investing in Africa. It's very difficult, as I've mentioned, to get your goods from point A to point B, and especially um, if, if investment into infrastructure is so low in Africa. And then number three, that uh, one that we all know very well, um, but that it's also a global problem, um, is corruption. As I've mentioned, our latest publication focuses on infrastructure. So, what I want to highlight here is that there are so many aspects to speak about from this topic. Um, we have looked at the dire need for infrastructure investment in Africa. The latest African Development Bank report on infrastructure, a brilliant report, and it will help your type of business also to understand the infrastructure and the logistics environment um, in Africa. But the latest report, which has now been updated, now it says that Africa needs 130 to 170 billion US dollars annually to be able uh, to narrow this uh, infrastructure deficit. From power all the way to transport, how much is needed? A few years back when the African Development Bank started this report, it was only 90 billion US dollars that was needed. That was less than five years ago. So the need is is very strong. But that is where we see the opportunity for investment into these areas. If we look at the quality of infrastructure, we also use the African Development Bank's index for um, infrastructure development, and we overlay that with some economic aspects and doing business as aspects. And these are your top 20 best infrastructure environments in Africa. Now, it includes hard infrastructure like roads, railways, ports, airports, all the way to your soft infrastructure like education, healthcare, water and sanitation. You'll notice, apologies, that I think the text is quite small, but you will notice that economies from your island economies, North Africa and Southern Africa, are ranked your best infrastructure quality on the continent. Now, those reasons are very simple. Your North and Southern African countries have been your more developed and more diversified economies on the continent. And then your island economies, naturally, they want to attract tourism. So to easily get your tour tourist from the airport to the hotel, 
Do they have access to the internet? In fact, Seychelles has the best ICT infrastructure on the whole continent. But again, that country is very small. So it's, it's, it's quite difficult to compare it to your larger economies like Nigeria. Very interestingly, a country like Zimbabwe is in the top 20. I do believe Zimbabwe, I haven't mentioned it earlier, but I do believe if Zimbabwe's political situation gets sorted out, now that is something I definitely cannot predict. Um, but what I want to mention here is that Zimbabwe actually has the infrastructure. It just hasn't, hasn't been refurbishing it over the past decade because of political turmoil. If they start refurbishing it, I project in the next three to five years that this is going to be one of the fastest growing economies in Africa. It's a big statement to make, a very bold statement, but it still has significant resources. It has the infrastructure there, as I've mentioned, it just needs to be fixed. Um, and of course, um, it's a country that's very close to our borders, well, it is a bordering country, um, and we've already seen a lot of business from South African corporates going back into Zimbabwe. Ladies and gentlemen, um, unfortunately, as I mentioned, I cannot highlight everything that we cover in this document, but these are the three, well, sorry, the five chapters that we focus on in this document, and you can go through it in your own time. We focus on hard infrastructure, which countries are now developing road, roads and railway networks, electricity, for instance, and we highlight which countries are currently um, implementing these projects, what the project names are, the, the, the amount of dollars going into these projects, um, and where we are seeing them going in the future. Very similarly, with soft infrastructure, unfortunately, this is probably one part um, that was very difficult to write because it is such a simple concept to fix, um, but we are not seeing that happening um, in most of the, uh, the African countries. And that is the key to inclusive growth in Africa. And with inclusive growth, we mean it, are those growth rates from an Ethiopia, for instance, 8%, 9% growth, actually trickling down to the man on the street? And the answer is no, not really yet in Africa. Um, we look at financing infrastructure, which I will touch on very briefly in my last four minutes that I have. We look at regional infrastructure, so um, which railways are connecting which countries. Um, for instance, East Africa has that standard gauge railway project that is currently um, being built. And then, of course, we just look at a nice-to-have section, the rise of new technologies in Africa. So just very briefly from a financing perspective, and this is where the private sector needs to step in. Africa's infrastructure funding and a sectoral split, on the left-hand side you'll see public funding, and on the right-hand side you'll see private funding. 90% of all infrastructure investment is funded by governments not by the private sector. The rest is the private sector, but 10% is very small. And as I mentioned earlier, the fact that most of these governments in Africa do not have savings, they do not have money at the moment to invest <laughs> into infrastructure, we need this graph to change significantly. And on the left-hand side, you'll see that the public sector or the governments are investing heavily into your larger projects like power, like infrastructure, for instance, your, um, your transport, um, and then only um, then into construction and social infrastructure. On the right-hand side, you'll see that the private sector invests heavily into construction. And wh why is the reason for this? It's because construction projects are so short-term in nature and the risk is much less. And of course, we know that the risk is high of investing on the continent. But again, we as I've mentioned, with the negative are the positive side. We, we definitely seen this graph changing ever so slightly over the past few years. We are starting to see private sector investment going into your more energy related and your road and railway sector networks. And that is because governments are realizing they need private sector's support. From a public and private sector investment, from a project perspective, we see that Nigeria has the most projects happening from an infrastructure perspective. Unfortunately, as you see the different bars, the yellow bars are the, uh, the private sector um, involvement. But it's Nigeria, Ethiopia, and Egypt that are your top three countries that are now currently seeing your largest infrastructure, well, not largest projects, but the most at the moment. And then I just also want to highlight, now I've mentioned um, yes, our rankings, there's always some caveats to rankings, but what we've done is we've actually plotted 
our investment attractiveness rankings that I showed you at the beginning on the left hand side of that graph and we plotted it against to the number of projects that are now happening in each country. And you can see a very strong correlation between our rankings and infrastructure investment. So where your infrastructure is, that is where we are going to see the growth, um, the growth drivers over the next few years. Ladies and gentlemen, um, just finally, um, where is investment going? So we've mentioned from an infrastructure project wise, it is definitely going into countries like Nigeria, Ethiopia, and Egypt. Um, regionally, we have seen quite a significant shift. Foreign direct investment, so that's your, your hard dollar investments into uh, projects. It doesn't mean portfolio investments into the equities or into the capital markets. It's hard investment into projects. Mm -hmm. We have seen that it's changed the scope in regional perspective in Africa. Am I standing in front of the... No. Uh, from a regional perspective, we've seen that East Africa is now the largest recipient of foreign direct investment. This never used to be the case. It used to be Southern Africa and North Africa. And now, as I've mentioned, we've seen significant infrastructure investment into East Africa. Who are the countries that are receiving the most attention? This slide and the table that I'm showing you here highlights the amount of projects currently happening in Africa. So this is the latest numbers we could get. So 2017, 2018 numbers. South Africa is still a large recipient of attraction into projects. Um, and we can see countries like Morocco, Kenya, for instance. But in dollar terms, South Africa is not even in the top 10 anymore. And again, because um, we have now seen how we've dropped um, in certain um, surveys across the world, and we are seeing attention from investors shifting to countries with larger growth rates or, or, or bigger growth rates, like in Ethiopia, Egypt. Egypt, Ethiopia, those are the two largest recipients of investment over the past two years. And then who are the countries that are investing the most? Again, project terms. It's the US, the UK, and France. But in dollar terms, it is China. So we can't get away from the fact that China is a heavy investor into most industries. And, but everybody is still um, concerned that it's only into the resources sector. But in fact, it is also into manufacturing. So we've seen quite a nice change on where Chinese investment is going. And then lastly, the evolution of sector attention. A few years back, the extractive industry, as I've mentioned, is the largest recipient of FDI, but we have seen a shift over the past few years into your retail products, into telecommunications, but the latest numbers are showing manufacturing is the largest recipient at the moment of FDI, and then of course we are starting to see infrastructure and power specifically um, being a large beneficiary. So for me, this is one of the most positive slides that I can show, that even though we have that large infrastructure investment or uh, investment deficit, we are starting to see that that is changing. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for having me today. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I did promise that she knew how to join the big dots. She knew where to point us. And she has certainly set the navigation systems around us firmly in terms of where the big areas of growth, but also the big areas of opportunity, whether you're in trade and logistics or any other business on the continent are. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much to Ms. Celeste Falconer of Iran Merchant Bank, for being the first national bank stable today for her insights. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the close of the main forum as well as our opening ceremony. <laughs>